Why, maiden, she's the nurse of pure and high affection, the stay of the oppressed, the redresser of grievances, the curb of the power of the tyrant. Nobility were but an empty name without her, and liberty finds the best protection in her lance and her sword. There is nothing outside of yourself that can ever enable you to get better, stronger, richer, quicker or smarter. Everything is within. Everything exists. Seek nothing outside of yourself. Hello noble ones, welcome back to my channel. This is the Metatron speaking. Now finally, it is time to fulfill my promise of making a video comparison, a comparative video, between the knight's chivalry or chivalric code and the samurai's bushido. I would like to first start talking about the medieval European chivalric code and then compare it to the oriental Japanese bushido. So when we think of the chivalric code, the most common idea that comes to mind is that of the noble knight in shining armor. But there are many different kinds. So rather than focusing only on the chivalric code of the late Middle Ages, I would like to go all the way back and understand the roots and the beginning, the origin of the code. The, uh, the so-called institution of knighthood was developed between 1170 and 1220. But something that I wanted to point out in this video is that this idea of a code precedes these dates. So the late medieval code of chivalry had arisen from this idealization of early medieval synthesis of two martial traditions, the Roman martial tradition and the Germanic martial tradition. The concept of bravery, training, now, of course, as time passes and we reach the late Middle Ages, the code becomes more refined, emphasizes social and moral virtues rather than being in an actual battle code. But let's have a very brief look at how it was originally. When we start thinking of the concept of the knight, one of the first concepts of, of European knight is that of the crusader. But there were knights before. In fact, if we think about the Norman cavalry, they were knights as well, and they also had some codes of conduct. But we can go even further back. Well, the Romans had cavalry, the equites. Now, I need to give you a little bit of information here about the cavalry in the Roman army very briefly, because that this topic would deserve a full video, which I will probably make. But it is true that often as we think of the Roman army's cavalry, we imagine the auxilia. So we're talking about the basically the mercenaries, the standing non-citizen corps of the imperial Roman army. And it is true that by the second century, Anno Domini, the Roman army's cavalry and more specialized troops, for example light cavalry and archers, were mostly auxilia. And it is also true that the these non-Italian troops were used also by the Roman Republic. But this is after 200 BC. The Equites, so the actual Roman cavalry, so the citizen cavalry, constituted the lower of the two aristocratic classes of ancient Rome. So it's not too different, okay? We can see where this concept of nobility and mounted forces together comes from. So the um, equites, they ranked below the patricians, and during the Roman kingdom, so the Regnum Romanum, and the first century of the Republic, legionary cavalry was recruited, uh, recruited exclusively from the ranks of the patrician, who were in fact expected to provide six centuria of cavalry. So we're talking about 300 horses for each consular legion. So we have said that the codified medieval noble conduct only began around 1170. Now before that we have what's called the noble habitus, which is basically a pre-chivalric noble code. Forbearance, the knight's self-control at the courts of their lords and towards other warriors. Hardihood, but what we understand is that a mature nobleman should have hardiness. It should be one of his moral virtues. Liberality. Now, generosity was part of a noble quantity. At that time, this concept should not be only considered as the idea of giving away, but also the idea of not being greedy, for example. And of course, no one and nothing should be able to bribe a knight. Honor. Probably one of the most famous ones. This one precedes the code itself. 
the loss of honour is a humiliation to a man's standing and is worse than death. Of course, losing your honour would mean not to be able to pursue the qualities that we have talked about. Then I wish to discuss ultimately about the Davidic ethic. This one obviously is derived by the clerics um, from biblical tradition. Good rulership as it was articulated by the Frankish church. So for example a rightful authority based on protection not oppression. The idea of respecting widows and orphans. So it should be considered as the opposite of a cruel and unjust ruler. Of course the concept of loyalty precedes and predates all of these other concepts because we find that in Roman times even Roman legionaries had this concept of loyalty, discipline, we find bravery in combat. As a matter of fact as we read the Bello Gallico we see that uh, Caesar often commends those centurions who were brave in battle. As we move forward in time, as I said before, courtly manners and respect for women also become part of the knightly code. But probably the most important thing that we can say about the knight's code is that we have to consider that there isn't really one version. There are many possible versions written, for example, by philosophers, writers. Also, we need to consider there are many different orders. For example, the fact that we have fully religious orders, uh, such as the Templars, where, of course, the situation will become much more religiously oriented than just simple noble knights, for example. As a matter of fact, the Templars, uh, they, they used to pray seven times a day, and they had to grow beard to, to basically be more similar to, to Jesus Christ. The whole concept of the sword also being a cross, for example, there is a lot of symbolism there. The fact that they could not own earthly possessions as single knights, but only the order could own riches, for example. And no matter what language we use, we should really use the full name. Because with the short name, for example, in English we have the Knights Templar. In French we say l'ordre du Temple. In Italian we say i cavalieri templari. But I think that it's the full name in Latin that really reminds us this concept. Pauperes comilitones Christi templique salomonici. And I have used ecclesiastical pronunciation on purpose here. Pauperes poor fellow soldiers of Christ. One of the richest orders ever founded in history. All of these, if, you, if you're interested in the Templar part, um, there is, I did make a video about the Templars and here is the link if you want to click there and you will have a bit more of a detailed introduction to the Templars. But for now let's just consider those uh, things that we find most commonly in many Knights Codes. We have courage, justice, mercy, generosity, faith, nobility and hope. The shining armour that shields him and inspires people all around. Meanwhile, on the other side of the world, Japan had its own noble warriors, the samurai. And as we think of the Japanese samurai, we also imagine and think of the Bushido, the way of the warrior which is somewhat analogous to the concept of chivalry. The term itself, as we said, it means the way of the warrior, where bushi means warrior and do means way. Although, as an orientalist, I wish to say a couple of things on this. Um, both bushi and do are Sino-Japanese readings, meaning that that's the on-yomi of these Japanese characters. So the, the way we are pronouncing them now as Bushido is, it's, it is a Japanese term, but it comes from Chinese. The, this reading of these characters come from Chinese, just as much as the characters come from Chinese anyways. The original Japanese reading of these ca two characters being Tsuamono or Mononofu. But in modern and current Japanese, these terms, these readings have now become basically, have now become almost obsolete. And most Japanese use the term Bushi. The original Chinese, or at least Mandarin Chinese pronunciation of these characters being Wu Shi Wu Shi. So from Wu Shi we have Bushi. And this is something that happens a lot in Japanese because the Japanese don't have the vowel sound that the Chinese have in Shi, for example. So in Japanese it always becomes a E sound. So shi becomes shi and loses the pitch, the tone, the fourth tone in this case. Although the tone should not really 
surprise us considering that for example in Cantonese uh, it would become a sixth tone so so it really depends on from what area of China they actually got the original term and reading and the sh sound will become a s sound etc which is something that already happens in the southern uh, dialects of China even in Mandarin speaking areas we have the loss of sh towards s as a pronunciation the character Do, pronounced in Sino-Japanese reading, the on yomi in Mandarin Chinese, this one becomes Dao, Dao, whereas the original Japanese sound would be Michi. So, if we want to read it the original Japan with the original Japanese reading, Tsuwa mono no Michi, or Mono no Fu no Michi. Mandarin Chinese, Wu Shi Dao, Wu Shi Dao. Sino-Japanese reading, Bushido. Now, one first difference that we can see between Bushido and chivalric code is the period where it was thought to be developed. Because with the Bushido, we are talking about 16th century to the 20th century. It's more of a modern thing compared to chivalric code. Now, this very statement sometimes is challenged by quite a few scholars debating that uh, this code, similarly to what happened in the, with the Chivalry Code, was built on a legacy which dated back, presumably, to the 10th century. So if that was the case, and it's still debated, but if that was the case, then they would be quite similar from this point of view. Although the actual formal coding would have happened earlier in Europe than in Japan. So again, let's compare the dates. So what can, you, can we say about the code? and where it originated from. Well, Bushido is a code of moral principles, which samurai were required to observe. But most of the time this code was oral, and it kept being oral for longer. Now, to give you some bibliography that you can read, to consider it as, as a reference to this video, we have, for example, the uh, Hagakure, as related by Yamamoto Tsunetomo to Tsunamoto Tashiro. The Hagakure contained many sayings attributed to the Sengoku period, regarding Bushido and the related philosophy. But please keep in mind that this book was compiled in the early 18th century and kept secret at first. Of course, reading the Book of Five Rings by Miyamoto Musashi, that is a very important mention. And as a matter of fact, I will now read a couple of sayings from these books. Bushido is realized in the presence of death. This means choosing death whenever there is a choice between life and death. There is no other reasoning. The ultimate aim of martial arts is not having to use them. So Bushido, just as much as the chivalry code, needs to be considered as an organic growth of decades and centuries of military career. So we have seen that the chivalry code was a blending, a mixture between pagan or heathen war values and Christian or religious values. Well, a similar thing happened with the samurai's Bushido. Bushido was born from Neo-Confucianism and it was also influenced by Shinto and Zen Buddhism. So in Bushido we most commonly stress, uh, for example, frugality, loyalty, martial arts mast mastery and honor unto death. But another similarity that we have with the Chivalric Code is the fact that it, this all virtue and religious aspect was not in, in the beginning part of the warlords' expectations from samurai and warrior classes. Similarly to Roman generals, daimyo and Japanese warlords expected mostly bravery in combat from their warriors. So again, from loyalty we move to more idealized forms of chivalric code and bushido, permeated with religious morals and precepts. Bushido has mainly seven virtues, as envisioned at least by Nitobe Inazo, righteousness, gi, courage, yu, benevolence, jin, respect, de, sincerity, makoto, honor, meiyo, loyalty, chugi, and as associated virtues, filial piety, ko, wisdom, chi, fraternal respect, te. And this is what really fascinates me. Two cultures in the opposite sides of the world created very similar concepts of conduct for the top class warriors as knights and samurai were the zenith of the respective armed forces associated with the upper echelons of the warrior classes. 
as an introductory level uh, video to this very deep and wide topic. I think that for today I have taken already enough of your time. Thank you very much for your time and thank you for watching. And remember, the Metatron has spread its wings. Goodbye. Suddenly